we can um okay i think that you guys have uh, access to the link correct uh not in my message yet okay here yeah. i think it's in the top but Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's interesting, um, Jeremy, for you to know. Uh, when uh, when the dean of my our university and Jose Alberto had the meeting with uh, Dr. Galvão and the others from uh, there is there was a, a, another professor responsible for the for a scientific network in Brazil and in, and the worldwide in fact uh, they became the the point that they became more more they liked it more was the word the fact that to have this show and tell once a month they oh, liked yeah. it very much the idea so it, oh, the students go there. They present research and ideas. Yes, yes. We invited people come and, and explain. So that's they, good. They good like to know. Uh, yeah. What I do like about the show and tell is most of the educators who are watching have gone through a lot of problems with Tiny ML, getting these things working. So we do understand some of the pain points that the students go through. Um, uh, I think I think we. Oh, Andrew, are you good? Yes, uh, my partner Aton's here. He just joined. Hello, Aton. Aton. Oh, there he is, Aton. Okay, so welcome to the tenth show and tell, uh, Tiny ML 4D. Uh, we get students from all over uh, presenting their Tiny ML projects. Some of them are just beginning and they're looking for uh, advice. Others are fully done projects. Uh, most of the people watching are fairly familiar with Tiny ML, and we have three main presenters today: Andrew and Itten uh, from USA. We've got Collins from Kenya. We've got Yusuf from Morocco, and we have James and Melissa Melissa, who will probably present next show and tell, which is March twenty eighth. So, uh, any presentation from uh, ICTP, Marco? Not really. We just published the call for the next online workshop, which is going to happen online from the 6th to the 10th of May. So, I will copy the link in the chat in a second. Awesome. And with that, uh andrew are you gonna take over the screen yeah sounds good one second i think he is google meets in the water Yeah, it's finding it. It's a little up arrow in the middle. There we go. Good. Yep. Okay. Great. Okay, so then um, let's get started then. Um, we're glad to be here today. Um, as we said, um, we're from the University of Pennsylvania, and um, Aton and I actually took Professor Rahul Mangaram's um, Tiny ML course um, at UPenn as freshmen, and we're here to share our project, which kind of had the goal of using Tiny ML actually to um, revolutionize beekeeping. So, quick intro of ourselves. Um, I'm Andrew. I'm pursuing a dual degree in electrical engineering and statistics and finance. And on to you, Aton. 
for the Almeidaan, and I'm studying computer science and finance. So yeah, we thought we'd start with promotional video we made. Um, pretty good at explaining our project, and so pretty exciting. Are you guys able to hear the sound, by the way? Okay, great. Yeah. Bees are essential for pollination, which in turn is vital for the reproduction of various plants and the maintenance of ecosystems. By understanding bee behavior and their unique communication methods, we can optimize hive placement and improve foraging efficiency. In order to effectively capture the bees' waggle dances without disturbing them, we fitted a hive with an IR camera and an array of IR LEDs. These lights illuminate the bees inside the hive without affecting their natural behavior. The camera records high-quality images, which the Raspberry Pi processes to detect the waggle dances in real time. Once we've established bounding boxes, we detect the bee's orientation using a custom vector detection algorithm, which leverages line detection and line density calculations. Our automated bee dance detection system demonstrates the power of combining technology and sustainable agriculture to transform beekeeping practices and contribute to a healthier, more sustainable future for our planet. So the main problem that we're trying to solve is the hive placement, right? Many um, beekeepers and apiaries have a lot of trial and error when they're trying to figure out where to put these beehives. They try to put them in, you know, in circles or different patterns to say, hey, how close can we put it to the source? And is that going to increase um, our production of honey and pollination? Next slide. So the main question that we're trying to solve is, can we use these bee dances to infer the location and richness of the pollination sources? So the way we did that is we started by saying, hey, can we even detect these um, bee dances and find the direction? So the, the video on the right, you can see a waggle dance of a bee. Press play there. There you go. And you can see um, there's different patterns that we can detect there as well. Next slide. So the three main features of this waggle dance is to say, where's the direction of the food? Um, what sources are limited in the hive, and this is the way they communicate uh, amongst themselves. So it's very important to um, be able to detect and communicate between the two uh, in order for the survival and production efficiency of the hive itself. Okay, so now let's talk about the solution overview. So um, there's kind of three key parts. We deployed a TensorFlow light model um, onto a Raspberry Pi. Um, Raspberry Pi was equipped with a wide lens IR camera for optimal detection of B Weigel dances. And um, of course, we also did data collection, pre-processing, model dev, model deployment, and results analysis as well. Um, so all of these different steps kind of fall into a pipeline. So um, this is our planned pipeline for kind of more long-term um, where we actually want to detect and understand bee dances. So for data collection, um, we captured a lot of video footage um, for bees performing various dance types, including the waggle dance within the hive. Um, we pre-process by essentially extracting frames, doing some processing, doing some labeling. Um, and then we did a, and then we plan to build a deep learning model using these 
process images to essentially classify and understand the different types of V-dances. Um, finally, of course, um, the basics, we do some result analysis as well as um, finally deployment on the edge with um, some low power resource constraint device, such as a Raspberry Pi Zero, um, which we could then use to do real-time classification of V-dances. Specifically for this project, in order to examine the viability of our plan pipeline, um, we still collected all the footage necessary, but um, we chose to focus on kind of just doing some um, classification and bounding box problems, um, as well as uh, an algorithm to essentially find the vector direction showing the direction bees are facing, um, and then doing some results analysis on that and um, deploying that real time. So yeah, let's talk about the steps in more detail. Um, so the first step was data collection, which we collected from various online sources, uh, mainly um, several open source data sets. A lot of them were collected using PS4 cameras, which happened to be cheap, high quality, and um, able to capture footage in the IR band. Um, and then also we acquired some of our own custom footage from apiaries as well to supplement our data. Uh, with this data, we did some light pre-processing. Um, we took a lot of these images, cut them into manageable chunks, as you can see here. And we also boosted the contrast to make the bees easier to see in grayscale. Um, after that, we then proceeded to manually label over 85 images with over 1,000 labels indicating kind of the direction, the general direction of the bees, as well as um, bounding the bees themselves. So using this data set of 85 images with over 1,000 labels, we trained and developed our model, which is our, so this model is specifically the bounding boxes model. So um, due to kind of compute and training data constraints, we decided to utilize the, um, the help of previously built models. So we utilized the YOLO v5 small architecture in order to do our bounding box detection training, the inferences. Um, so in order to do this, we froze the backbone because the backbone in the YOLO v5 small architecture is for feature extraction. So not much will change through us training that section. So there wasn't really a point in actually training it. And also the feature extraction was also pretty high quality already. So uh, mainly we trained uh, the neck and the head in order to specialize our um, YOLO v5 small architecture for actually B classification tasks. Then um, after we built that model and we were able to see all of these bounding boxes, we then created a uh, vector detection algorithm, which essentially um, detected the uh, vector direction the bee was facing, since uh, the vector direction is actually a very good kind of general indicator of the direction that the bee came from and the direction that the bee is communicating to the uh, hive as to where the different foraging sources for pollen are. So um, combining this with just some generally available knowledge like um, the relative direction of the sun relative to the frame, um, the frame of view of the image, um, we're able to do a lot of interesting calculations on the consumer end with that. But yeah, this technology was quite simple, really. We used just huff line transforms in order to generate a bunch of lines and then create a consensus on which direction the B was facing. Then we had pretty good results actually as well for our model once it was quantized and um, pruned as well. So we had a 2.3% recall for both our classification task and the bounding box drawing task. So those two combined together, our metric for recall was quite high. Um, you can also see we followed a pretty normal training curve, didn't run into any issues with like local minima or, um, or 
anything like that when we were doing our training. Um, we didn't have any of those issues with, during the gradient descent. Um, and finally, our model ended up being 14.3 um, megabytes in TF light form with um, floating point 16, which we quantized down from floating point 32. Um, so yeah, finally, let's talk about the model and hardware deployment. So after we created this model, as well as created our algorithm to do the vector detection using half lines, we combine these two together into a Python script, which we then deployed on a Raspberry Pi. So the Raspberry Pi essentially was connected to an IR camera mounted inside this kind of custom hive setup that we had built using, um, using some laser cut parts as well as 3D printed parts. Um, this Raspberry Pi connected to the camera was able to capture, pre-process and reshape um, the footage and then kind of feed it into the model and then the Huffline algorithm in order to run inference on individual frames. And overall, we had actually pretty decent results with that. We were able to conduct kind of real-time detection of bees and their vector direction. Um, we had live rendering at approximately two frames per second, which isn't the best, but um, as we'll see later on, we had quite a few ideas to improve this performance. But for now, um, Here's a demonstration of our physical prototype. And yeah, so as you can see, we actually used um, my iPad initially to simulate kind of Beehive because we didn't have um, access to the APRs at the time. So um, we did what we could with what we had, and um, you can see the results are pretty good still. So now um, I'll pass on to Aton to summarize a little bit. Yeah, so we use a lot of different uh, resources at the university, such as their laser cutter and 3D printers, uh, and a lot of other stuff they, they let us use, which is awesome. Um, one big thing, as you see on the model, you'll see in a later image, between the actual camera and the beehive is a basically a film of plexiglass. The reason is because we want to still be able to let, um, you know, the infrared camera still be able to shine through and, and collect data. But at the same time, um, any foreign substance that's in the hive that the bees don't recognize, they'll cover with propolis, right? Which is like a sap sort of thing, and you can't see through it. So the idea of we would make this sort of removable channel that you could pull out and just either wipe off or, or change out, uh, which was something that we um, learned, learned along the way there um, as well. If you're on the next slide. So um, our beam monitoring system we deployed in farm in um, New Jersey to collect uh, more data and analysis is still there. Um, just you know recording a bunch of data that we'll eventually do um, something with in the future. Um, but what was really interesting to see is um, the propolis, and that was like a big thing to take into account. Like how often we need to change these things if we make um, a hive. Um, that, that is retrofitted with, with this technology, how often we have to uh, apply maintenance. So that was just a really good um, uh, experience as well. So in the future, we hope to build some sort of large scale model of this and uh, deploy it on um, a bunch of different farms and APRs to see how we can um, affect a lot of people with this in order to increase the efficiency. Um, as you saw in the video, if you take two hives, um, and you put, let's say, a source of food in the middle on the line of symmetry, the waggle dance will actually point symmetric to, to the center, uh, which is an interesting thing that uh, we learned along the way, that they are communicating. It's not just um, you know, a myth that that's something we believe. Yeah, so then finally on the technical side, a few points. Um, as promised on how we decided to kind of go forward with improving our model. So um, our images were captured in 1080p, but um, we learned that this might not be the best way to go about deploying something, especially at the edge. Um, so we really want to reduce kind of the load on our um, models. So we want to try and um, do inference on 360p or 480p. So we're trying to adopt some sort of like teacher student model where we can have the teacher kind of generate um, the labels, the correct labels for the data and then um, do some knowledge distillation on that in order to allow us to actually downsize our model to a smaller model, which 
retains most of kind of like the features and the kind of like understanding of um, the larger model that we implemented here. Um, furthermore, uh, we use like a pre-built architecture, the YOLO v5 architecture, but um, using some custom architecture as well as just like pulling out some layers here and there or reducing the size of these layers um, could further improve our model deployment on edge devices as well. Um, also, the issue with puff lines was that um, we realized that actually that part also took up time. It wasn't very computationally consuming, but um, it just took a lot of time for um, all of the lines to be kind of like averaged up in the end. So that wasted a few milliseconds here and there ended up adding up to cause kind of like our low FPS. So if we use some more kind of modern technologies for object tracking, like common filters or something, we can probably do the object tracking as well as um, kind of like um, vector detection as well um, more accurately by kind of just like looking at the direction the B is going and moving in something like that. Um, probably will give us more accurate results, also more interesting insights. And that pretty much concludes our presentation. Um, we kind of created a project board with the overall idea of our project. And yeah, we're open to any questions or comments, advice. Um, Andrew and Etten, that is a very, very impressive project. Uh, that was so interesting to watch. Um, I think we probably have a lot of questions, but I really don't want to push Collins and uh, Yusuf's presentation. Uh, other than say one question, can we put most of the questions till the, the end of the um, thing? Is there someone out there got a really pressing one for Andrew and Anton? Yeah, I just wanted to make a suggestion. Sounds good. Cool. Oh, okay. okay. Well, quickly, uh, just quickly, uh, very great project, guys. I love it. And um, just, I don't know. I joined a few minutes later into the presentation. I missed the beginning. Uh, I don't know around choosing choosing the the pie. So, have you guys looked at the Nvidia like Jetson? I know they're hard to get sometimes, but um, they will take care of your inference problems and also maybe take a look at DeepStream from Nvidia uh, because there's actually um, it's G streamer based pipeline. It's quite you can use Yolo five. I think with it, but you can also use it with other versions up to eight, I think. Well, actually, it should work with it, but there's some stuff with the output, output, um, output layer of Yolo, which you have to add a custom plugin into output on the new, on the later versions. But what's cool about that is there's also a tracker built into the pipeline as well. Um, mm. they, so they use common filtering, but they also use um, another type of tracker. It was um, uh, one I've used with it's a correl discriminative correlation filter, if I remember correctly. But that could help. I don't think there's a vector analysis there. You have to build it customized, but you'll definitely get rid of the inference um, uh, speed problem, you know, like two frames per second, and mm -hmm. get bounding box detection. The other one is you could use edge impulses FOMA model, which will give you much better frame rate, but you won't get bounding boxes. You'll get, you'll get centroids around the actual bees, and I'm not sure how that will behave in a tracking, uh, with tracking, if you're not getting the full. Um, object, uh, you know, because you can just a centroid point. So yeah, just some 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 thoughts side. Yeah, thank uh, thanks, Peter. Um, Andrew, it, uh, that was an amazing uh, presentation. Uh, hopefully, you can hang on till the the other presentations because I I'm fairly sure people are going to have some questions for you guys. And, and, and the suggestion maybe people can also write uh, uh, the type the the questions in the the the, the message board here. Okay. Yeah, uh, great idea. Anyway, well done. Um, Collins, uh, oh, Andrew, uh, oh, we are. Uh, Collins, can you take over the presentation? Yes, you allow me to share my screen. Perfect. Awesome. Can we confirm that you can see my screen? Uh, it's just coming through. Yes, it's okay now. Is it now visible? Yep. 
Okay, awesome. So I'm Collins Bet, um, a student from Multimedia University of Kenya and pursuing electrical and telecommunication engineering. So I would like to present a project that I'm working on titled Artificial Visual Aid for the Visually Impaired. So the main aim of this project is to solve the challenge faced by the visually impaired, especially the totally blind, and enhance independence and mobility for them by ensuring that they are aware of their environment. Well, some few statistics that I managed to gather and that inspired me also into coming up with this project is the huge number of people suffering from total blindness and partial blindness and also visual impairment. So in Kenya alone, we have 680,000 Kenyans who are visually impaired and across Africa, we have up to 23 million who are visually impaired. And also I was inspired to do this project um, because a friend of mine, um, he lost his sight at the age of 28. So he used to see, but at some point he lost his sight. So I was trying to figure out how I can help someone and maybe offer a solution. So the idea of this project and how I shall implement it and how I have begun implementing it is through the use of ML and AI to collect images, videos, and be able to detect them, analyze them via trained ML models, and provide sound feedback to the user on what they are seeing and of the environment that they are in so that they can easily understand what is going on around them and be able to navigate their environment on their own. So as I've said, the specific objectives of this project is to enhance mobility and independence by coming up with a wearable device that will be able to collect visual data, um, detect the objects that it has seen, be able to provide feedback to the user and help the user act according to what he or she has had. So I'm trying to create an inclusive solution for the visually impaired persons. So this is not something quite new. It is an improvement of what is in the markets, though they have some, some of their own challenges and some of details that have been left out. So some models that have been developed include eSight 3 by CNET, so it's mainly for the dyslexic and also not really, it's, it doesn't really provide that necessary real-time feedback to the user. And also there is Ira, which is a blind AI assistant that will be able to screen read for you, um, give you information of what is in the digital media through sound feedback. And there is the auton glass for the dyslexic people, which mainly magnifies and corrects um, your dyslexic issue. And then there is WeWork, which is an improvement of the white cane, and the Google Lens and Apple Vision Pros, which are mainly virtual reality and AI assistants. So my proposed solution is to develop a wearable device with visual aid assistance um, through real-time sound feedback provision on what is going on in the environment. So the model is quite simple. I have chosen to implement uh, the project using camera sensors embedded on the ESP32. I'm using Xiao ESP32 Sense S3. So I have managed to write um, code to detect the 
videos and to stream to collect the images and the videos on the user's environment and be able to upload it to the cloud. Um, for this case, I opted to use for um, the Azure Vision Studio and the OpenCV model. So after collecting the URL of my ESP32 camera module stream, live video stream, I'm able to um, upload the video stream using my Python script and run it um, by calling APIs, by making API calls to the Azure Vision Studio and be able to process the videos and the images using pre-trained models and give sound feedback to the user through earphones and speakers on the wearable device that is connected with the ESP32. So an improvement that I'm seeking to make is to also include haptic feedback to the user. So let's say when I'm trying to give directions to the user or the user is navigating an environment that he or she regularly uses, I am able to guide him or her via haptic feedbacks. Um, so the project has encountered some few challenges. Uh, mainly, the main challenge is low latency. So in this case, let's say the user is um, along the streets or walking in a very high traffic region or area. Um, the user will really need to get feedback immediately and at really high speeds. So the wearable device has some latency, especially when collecting the video Your streams. Battery, please charge. Especially when collecting the video streams and giving that feedback to the user. So there's some delay, um, which is a challenge. And I would request for your advice later on, on how to deal with that latency. And also, availability of um, internet for real-time visual data processing scenes. Um, there are some areas in Kenya that don't have internet access and also in Africa and maybe some remote areas across the globe that maybe don't have that stable internet connection. So that's a challenge, but I was seeking to look into implementing it offline through pre-chain models embedded on the wearable gadget. So this is a, as you can see here on the screen, is a, a display of a scenario or a use case scenario by the user with a wearable device. So the white can is an existing technology that can be supplemented by our wearable device and through visual detection and uh, data collection and object recognition, we are able to provide sound feedback to the user. So as I had mentioned, the components that are used, we use the ESP32 CIO S3 Sense and which has a camera module on it and it collects the visual data and the URL is able to be accessed through the cloud by a Python script that you've written and make API calls to the Azure Vision Studio and also work alongside the OpenCV to provide a data processing and be able to give sound feedback to the user. So this was a demonstration. This was a demonstration of This was a demonstration of me running the of me running the sample code um, that we had used to the open CV. And later on, I'll also share the ESP32 module collecting the live stream videos from the environment. Processor. Um, we are using YOLO version 3, 
that we process the images and convert them to the text and I think it's frozen. Oh, it looks like it's frozen, sorry. Uh, after I get the image, so for demonstration, we have used our laptop's camera and it shall identify the object in front of it. So after running the code written in Python, it will detect my image. Um, it will detect my image and give it back of the identified object. As you can hear, it is informing me that the detection a person. So that's it. And you can also change images or objects when the when the board encounters different objects, let's say a cup or a ball or a car, the model will be able to identify the object since it has retrained data sets for various objects. Thank you. So let me, let me share the ESP32 model collecting the video streams and the objects around it. So the, the model is yet to be fully complete with an with a working prototype uh, embedded attached on a frames or glasses. So this is me running the code of collecting the data streams. So the camera module is able to collect the streams and, uh, and project the visual data of the cups and the surrounding environment. And this video that I'm streaming, I'm able to access it by the cloud and process it and give sound feedback to the user as I demonstrated in the previous video so thank you and this was my presentation and i am here to share my idea and also look for your advice on how i can improve it more thank you thank you colin um that's a that's a lot of work big project and switching it to the, the edge is, uh, I'm sure lots of people have some suggestions here. Uh, quickly, anyone? Uh, Marcelo, I'm sure you've got something to, to add here. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, as he said, I mean, I, I think that the, 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 the challenge that Collins has now is to take the project to the edge and not using, you know, all the, 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 the cloud, let's say, to do the, to do the processing. So the idea is try to reduce as much as possible and do all the inference uh, at, at a device. Maybe can also, uh, let's say, to be restricted to the to the to the to the cell phone, to the to use the cell phone to do the processing. So you don't need to go to 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 there to to be offline. It's something like that. I think this is the next next step. You no, know? go to the edge. Yeah, the the cell phone is probably a good idea because. If you're sticking with the present teaching uh, microcontrollers, th they probably don't have uh, the power. Uh, whereas the cell phone probably actually can do a lot of what you want to do without sending all those images uh, up to your cloud site. Um, uh, other other comments before we move on to Yusuf? Okay, uh, and uh, if, if people want to hang around and, and give some general comments and feedback, uh, that would be really good. Uh, 
Um, thank you so much, Collins. It's a great big project you're working on. And is Yusuf, uh, I can't see him at the moment. Is Yusuf out there? Thank you. Yes, I'm here. Uh, do you see my screen? Yep, perfect. Okay. But hi, everyone. I'm uh, Youssef uh, Abadad. I'm a PhD student and uh, software engineer. Uh, uh, it's great to be here with you. Uh, the project is supervised by uh, Nabil Ben Amar and Habib al -Shawi. Uh, I'm excited uh, to present our project uh, on classifying long uh, disease within tiny ML. Our goal is to make a tiny ML model can uh, recognize uh, between asthma and healthy lung sounds to be uh, deployed uh, in a microcontroller. Um, the content of my presentation first, I will uh, start by introduce, uh, introducing uh, the problem we want to solve in our project. Uh, the solution and workflow data that we flowed in the uh, data set results, challenges and future work and uh, conclu uh, conclusion. According to a report by the World uh, Health Organization, resp uh, uh, resp respiratory diseases are one of the leading causes of uh, death uh, world, uh, worldwide. Moreover, it predicts that uh, 2013 resp uh, respiratory disease will, uh, could lead to an increase in the mortality rate, uh, rates. For the reason, early detection is the key factor in improving the effectiveness of uh, intervention. Uh, intervention. Uh, various clinical methods have been uh, developed uh, to diagnose uh, and evaluate long health condition, including compute, uh, computed uh, tomographic scans, chest x-rays, and uh, pulmonary function tests. However, these methods are often limited to high-end clinics to, uh, due to their complexity and high costs. In, uh, in contrast, uh, the st stethoscope offers uh, offer a no invasive low-cost, portable way uh, to diag uh, uh, diagnose lung disease. The stethoscope has been widely used in clinics. It has several associated challenges. Along these challenges, it relay in the expertise and judgment of the physician, which leaves the room for error in the, the diagnosis. Uh, moreover, uh, the lack of uh, a recording function in the convolu uh, convolution st uh, stethoscope that prevents other personnel from analyzing the sounds heard during uh, the consultation. For all these reasons, Digital st st stethoscope has been developed to record long sounds and enable the visualization and re retrospective analysis of lungs. In addition, wireless transmission uh, like uh, Bluetooth or Wi-Fi uh, uh, allows it to be used for remote dia uh, diagnosis and to store all long sounds in the cloud for further uh, analysis. Uh, thanks to the machine learning, especially deep learning and digital signal processing, the digitalizing uh, long sounds enable automation of uh, recognition of pattern related to the to the lung disease and uh, in distinguish abnormal long sounds from normal ones. However, there is a need to develop a lightweight yet powerful model for long sound diagnosis that is deployable and uh, embedded low-cost devices, it's, it's valuable in remote areas or developing countries where internet access may not be available, like uh, Africa. For the tiny ML is, uh, for a solution, tiny ML is an AI alternative that exclusively uses extremely low-profile devices to process AI algorithms with, with tiny ML. Uh, machine learning models are deploy, deployed directly, directly in low power microcontroller or edge devices. This allows for local processing of data instead of transmitting large amounts of data sensor to the cloud or uh, fog nodes. By, by reducing data transmission, power consumption, uh, and leading to improved uh, battery life. 
this has uh, this has motivated uh, us to develop a compact model capable of currently diagnosing two categories of long sound, healthy and asthma, switchable for deployment in microcontroller. Uh, to do our uh, project, we followed these steps. First, we got a data set and put it into each impulse. Uh, next, uh, we used the uh, MVCC uh, to pick out a feature from the data. Uh, we gave these uh, features to our CNN model to uh, to train it. After that, you have optimized our model to be suitable for deployment in a uh, microcontroller. We tried uh, out our uh, model uh, to be suitable for deployment in microcontroller. We tried, uh, and um, lastly, uh, you uh, you put it onto onto a microcontroller. For a data set, we have uh, utilized a public data set by a King uh, Abdullah Jordan University Hospital. It contains uh, 300, uh, 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 308 records obtained from a, a total of uh, 105 uh, patients with different respiratory conditions, such, uh, uh, such as asthma, pneumonia, heart failure, uh, bronchitis, uh, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. The audio files uh, were, were recorded using a single channel at a simple rate of uh, uh, 4 kilohertz, and all records were already filtered to reduce the interference with the, uh, with the heard uh, bit sounds. The dataset is unbalanced with a high, higher vol uh, volume of data available for the normal and asthma categories com compared to others. In this case, uh, you have chosen to rec uh, recognize two types of lung sound, uh, uh, such as uh, asthma and uh, normal uh, normal uh, category. Uh, you have used the uh, EG impulse uh, to uh, to to train and optimize uh, our model. Uh, a total of uh, 57 min minutes and uh, 25 seconds of data splitted into uh, training and testing set. Uh, the window size uh, was to uh, uh, 5,000 uh, milliseconds big, uh, to, uh, to, to cover uh, at least one bread. Uh, and the window's increase was uh, the same. For a feature extractor, uh, you have uh, you have used uh, mean frequency uh, spectral coefficients technique, or uh, MFCC for uh, for short. And as a classification model, you have used the uh, CNN. Uh, this, is, uh, this is our uh, our uh, architecture uh, model. There, uh, there is a result for both training and testing. You have achieved uh, an accuracy of uh, 90, 92% uh, percent and uh, 90, 95% in uh, testing and, uh, and uh, in training. Some of the concerns you had during, the, uh, you had during this, the project, uh, the unbalanced data, data set, uh you have uh, more data for just two category uh and uh, our feature works is to investigate alternative techniques or uh, uh, to 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 that to augment data uh, there are some uh, some research that uses uh, use the, that use the uh, auto encoder variant to uh, to generate uh, data uh and uh, for now we have not yet tested our model in real life uh, uh, scenarios we will deploy our model into digital uh, for future work uh, we will deploy our model into digital stethoscope for uh, t testing purposes you have uh, you have achieved a promising results to recognize uh, two categories of long disease using tiny ml model model the next steps uh, we will uh, we will uh, uh, work in making our model better maybe uh, by trying different architecture model 
maybe uh, using other uh, other uh, feature uh, structure techniques like uh, spectrogram uh, we also try to fix the challenge we talked about early about uh, imbalancing data thank you thank you yusuf uh, i really like that you you had this huge data set and you came down to uh, mainly using the tiny ml to identify one type and the asthma was a a good one to work on um we're done the presentations and we have uh, a few minutes here before the hour uh any questions for yusuf and uh let's let's do one right away for yusuf anyone out there um something i know sound analysis i find very difficult uh, good for you. I'd love to see your your project with with some people who have asthma. See what it says. Uh, any questions yes. here? Then let's open it up to um, all three of the presentations. We've got Andrew and Eaton with the bees, and Collins with the online blind and. He, um, uh, detection and moving towards uh, tiny ML, and then Yusuf with the uh, asthma detector. Um, open to, to anyone. Yeah, a first question uh, re regarding the B the B project. Uh, how how you see the the let's say to put a camera inside the 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 behave this like, was a problem i mean to disturb the bees do, do you do you study that that problem no yeah so um we spoke to a lot of different beekeepers and they said the biggest thing is to keep um, the hive dark right to keep everything dark inside as it would not disturb so the idea is we put that plexiglass um and and uh, mdf piece of wood there so um everything is is separate and contained and um, that way it wouldn't really affect the the normal activities um, of the bees Okay. So, uh, Brendan, you have a question? Yeah, um, yeah, no, no, really fascinating projects today. That they're really good to see. Um, just a quick question on the on on the bee project as well. Um, just fascinated, uh, you know, living in sustainable times. You know, how, how much power were you burning? Um, if you don't mind me asking, on your device. <laughs> um. So, we actually did have to like. Um, we, we had a lipo battery when we deployed it to the edge um we just did like a normal like plug-in um i think it was about twenty thousand. um what is it called milliamp hours um and then um and and we had to replace them maybe like every one or two days uh, and was there a lot of heat coming from the module that, it, that would that have influenced the bee dancing? I'm just out of interest. <laughs> um, yes. There was a lot of heat <laughs> off the sensor, right, Aton? Yeah. Yeah, we, we put a heat sink um, on the actual Pi, but also uh, okay. um, if you see in, in the image on the, the camera module, we put a fan um, inside to, yes. uh, to, to blow it out. Um, and yeah. ideally, in a future version, we have like a solar panel on top and a temperature sensor, we could somehow, you know, uh, yeah. we need those values. No, no, really cool project here. Well done, guys. Yeah. Uh, Peter, I think has a question. Yeah, thanks. Just yeah, just a question on the on the hive selection and placement of the camera, because obviously you have those those uh, racks in you know with the, with the, in the hive. Well, how do you choose which one to look at? And of course, in a in a in a real hive, is multiple of those racks up against each other. So. Would you look at the one right in the end, the, close to the edge, or would you look at, and, and again, are you looking for a queen? Are you looking at randomly, or it doesn't matter, are you looking at any specific bee? Um, so with that, I think uh, we're actually focusing on the worker bees because the worker bees are the ones that collect honey. Um, so usually hives, especially these hives uh, that we work with, they kind of have just one entrance for the bees to come in and out of. So we mainly want to monitor the entrance because it's kind of like well documented that um, worker bees are essentially the only bees that actually do the foraging. So they give us the mo most information on like where the pollen sources are, what's going on. And they always do their bee dances at the entrance of the hive. So as long as we're able to target and focus on that area, we can get most of our information. Um, 
usually the other types of bees are not as insightful they usually stay in the hive they don't have functions related to foraging as well as like kind of like uh, actually going out of the hive yeah something we also briefly worked on is um, how to identify the drone bees the worker bees and the queen right so we can identify the queen and we can see that at least the hive you know the beekeeper should get notified another thing we briefly worked in the end which could be another possible room for improvement um, is is detecting the varroa which are these mites um, on the bees and that, that you can um, detect by doing coupled image filters on top. Um, and that can actually kill the whole hive. So if you can detect that early, and that's really good information for the beekeepers. And that that was uh, that idea came out of conversations uh, with beekeepers say, hey, what, what need uh, can we solve for you guys? So I, I didn't quite get it. You're you, you detecting, um, I didn't quite get with light or what, what is that? Um, varroa mites. So they're just kind of a, a type of parasite that kind of like, Oh, oh, okay, my turn. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Now, awesome, um, guys. Marco, I had just one one question. And have you considered this Google Coral board, which seems to be yeah powerful enough yeah. for your application? Yeah, Professor Mongram actually recommended it to us, so um, we we're looking into that, and also the school is going to provide us with some. Uh, Marcelo, is that something the Grove uh, Vision AI board might be useful for too? Yes, maybe, maybe. But the, the point is the 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 the, the Vision AI from from C that the, just launched. In theory, I mean, it's for low power, and uh, in terms of uh, of uh, capacity, is lower than the Raspberry Pi. Uh, Raspberry Pi. That's the point. I mean. I, I understand that in, in, in this project, power is not really a, a big problem because you are working with uh, with the Raspberries. So we're talking about uh, let's say, uh, uh, watts watts uh, uh, level. It's not a, a matter for something that with low power. If you go to go under to, to really low power, maybe in the intermediary, I think the coral is is the best. And after that, maybe you can try the new, the, the, the growth that, that they use, the, the uh, harder accelerator, no? But uh, I don't know if it solved the, solved the problem with the latins. Yeah, because I think our idea was that we also wanted to target um, quantity because I think like having, um, so actually we want to target quantity in terms of how many devices we can deploy so like every hive can have one some of these guys have what like 50 hives or more so um definitely i think um cost as well as kind of like um accessibility yeah. is a yeah. really interesting factor there as well that we have to consider so that was why we were a bit hesitant yeah. about um about mm -hmm. the coral but that might be something we want to explore or kind of like well if you want yeah. to explore something cheap and uh powerful and uh, with low power maybe you can i think jeremy has, has have suggested you can try uh like uh, the, the the vision and i the growth vision and i i have put just put here a, a, a link this is a tutorial that uh i worked last week about that so maybe it's something that okay you, you can take in consideration Sounds good. Thank you so much. Great projects this week. Um, that B1 is just so complex. I, I've done lots of uh, getting close to what you were doing. Uh, it's a very impressive tiny ML project. Um, and, and Collins, trying to get your one down to the edge. That's going to be a huge challenge. And Yusuf, uh, I really like that you narrowed it down to to the asthma. It'd be really interesting if if your project can expand to other uh, lung diseases and the the real uh, testing it on real people will be really interesting. Um, typically, we finish uh, at the at the hour. Are there any uh, quick questions for for any of the people? Uh, Eaton raised a hand. Go for it. Oh, that was by accident. <laughs> no problem. Um, uh, Marco, any? Uh, I mean, excellent presentations. I mean, yeah. the yeah, 
really, really, yeah. really good ones. Very diverse and extremely interesting, you know, fields of application. So congratulations to all. And we hope to have you next month as well. Even if you're not presenting as, you know, uh, attendees to our show and tell. Super. Thanks a lot, guys. Excellent, people. Have a really good Thank day. You. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.